So my, my family, we, we gather one more time for this solemn series. To my family watching online and all of our guests, even those who are not followers of Jesus, we're glad that you're here. Um, to my online family that watches in cities across the country, I want to encourage you, if you can afford it, hop on a plane and be in this room next Sunday um, as we celebrate 10 years of gospel ministry. Just, just buy the plane ticket by faith. And uh, just come here by faith. Maybe you could stay in the homes of some of the people in the room. Just start sending emails. We'll get you a place to stay. That's, that's like New Testament, right? We'll open up our doors for some of you. If, you. if all you can afford is the plane ticket, we'll put you on the couch in the basement. We got host homes in the room. No? We got host homes in the room. Just get on the plane and just, just be in the room. There, there's some things you can't experience across a camera. And if you're part of our online family, all of you send us emails, you watch, you support financially. Man, make the sacrifice and be with us in Atlanta next Sunday as we celebrate 10. We're calling it the end of an era because we have some special elements. We have a special guest. I'm going to be making a special announcement, and we want you to be in the room when I make that announcement. For those of you who are in the room, I mean, 75% of you who are new to Victory, um, you joined our church, in a sense, after the pandemic. Uh, I know for some of you, you don't really feel what some of us who have been on this journey for a long time feel, and I understand that. Like, it's not exciting to you that we celebrate in 10 years. Uh, 10 is a milestone in church life and um, <clears throat> we hope that next Sunday what you experience will help you to see that you've been grafted into something um, that God's hand is on and has been on and something that is much bigger than just a Sunday morning service and we pray that that would that would register in your heart so uh, join us in being here you want to actually be here for the first song we got guest worship leaders uh, gonna be here we got uh, guest speakers gonna be here and I want to encourage you to, to honor the house the way you would honor your job. <clears throat> I want to encourage you next Sunday, just honor the house the way you would honor your job and actually be here on time uh, for the first song. So I guess worship leader can, can minister with you. And, um, and, and our worship pastor and our team, they, they've put together awesome worship set for you, and I believe it's going to be a, a blessing to you. And my wife and I are going to be making a very important announcement, sharing some very important words with you. So um, this is the final week of a series, a teaching series called Seven. We've been teaching through um, these seven letters that have been preserved for us in the New Testament book of Revelation. Um, uh, I've been joined in this series by our two elders. Last week, you had a chance to hear from our beloved Elder Milton James. <clears throat> and uh, the elder from Philadelphia preaching on the city of Philadelphia. And uh, I just love to see that great hair and that wisdom, like a father talking to us. And, um, and thank you for doing an awesome job handling the pulpit and the text. And um, I get an opportunity to shepherd this house with two elders, Elder Milton and Elder Eric Hayes, two godly men. Um, Elder Milton has been with me since, uh, since this church was founded. And Elder Eric and I have been walking with the Lord together since it's been almost 15 years or more since we was lived in North Carolina. We used to be out in the street sharing the gospel and, and uh, we were sharing the gospel where it was no church, it was no titles, it was no elder, no pastor. The gospel for us was never chained to the pulpit and, um, and we've had a long journey together and I thank God for these men who helped me shepherd the church. They shepherded me. They, they, they ministered to me and counseled me and rebuked me and correct me and tell me not to say things from the pulpit. 
not to use certain language because I'm a New Yorker and there's certain language that to me is normal where I'm from. It's a curse in the South and Elder Milton had to help me clean up my mouth. Remember those days? It's a true story. Huh? True story. I use, we use words in New York that in the South are curse words. In New York is just part of the language and Elder Milton had to help me clean up my mouth in the pulpit and say, he was pulling me aside and say, brother, you can't say things like that in the pulpit. We're in the South and, um, but, but, but thank God that I'm, I'm not above authority. <laughs> and I could be corrected. I think you're in a dangerous place when you can't be corrected. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that in a few moments. Um, so... Uh, if you're new, the book of Revelation is the last book of what we call the Bible, the corpus of Scripture, the 66 ancient documents. That book of Revelation um, is a prophetic book, speaks about prophecies that are going to come to pass. And I believe that for those of us who are sensitive and praying and watching, we could see God moving the chess pieces around the world preparing the world for the return of Christ. I, I, I'm doing everything I can to awaken as many people as possible to let you know that we are living in the last days. I, I'm telling you, and though we do not know the day or the hour, man, our time is running out. Um, in my yard, there is, a, there is a fig tree in my yard. And uh, every year that fig tree, it bears these little figs. They look like little grapes. They're fat grapes. And my kids would, they would harvest them and they'll crush them into like jelly and they'll eat them. I, I think it's nasty. They really love it. They eat it straight from the tree. <laughs> this year, that, that fig tree in my yard was at full bloom. But when we got up on that fig tree, it wasn't a lot of figs on the tree. And sometimes I stare at that tree because I know like, when there's no figs, I feel like the tree is in disguise. It's not really what it's supposed to be. And when the leaves start falling off, we know that it's changing from the summer to the fall. And, and when I see that fig tree every day in my yard, I think about the words of my Savior who said, although no man knows the hour or time when the Son of Man will return, but when you see the leaves falling off the fig tree, when you see these things, in rapid succession, those of us who are paying attention should look and watch and know that my return is near. Can I say something to you? The leaves are falling off the fig tree. And that's why those of us who are wise will stop wasting our... Yes. This book is going gonna, is gonna to come to pass whether people like it or not. They can't do anything to stop it. You really just got to decide what side of the train you want to be on. The part that's rolling into glory or the part that steamrolls people who reject the Lord because these things are happening right before our eyes. So we've been walking through uh, Revelation chapter 2 and 3. In Revelation chapter 1, the Lord Jesus Christ introduces himself to a man named John. One of his early followers was on a prison island for the sake of the gospel, he gets a revelation from Christ. Christ tells him, I want you to write seven letters to seven ancient churches and attach to them a full copy of the book of Revelation. And uh, we're going to devote this message to the study of that final letter written to a church that gathered in the ancient city of Laodicea. We're going to reflect on the cumulative words of Christ through these letters. Um, Spirit of the living God. Lord, I know that we're living in a time when, when Christians want to be entertained in church gatherings. We, we want to be moved and we want the preacher to work hard to make us feel some type of way. I'm a man and God, I know that this is a serious text and I pray whether in silence or response, Holy Spirit, you would do something to open the eyes of your sons and daughters. To provoke the heart of your children and maybe even trouble the heart of the unbeliever who was in the room. I ask for help communicating this difficult text. Yes, Lord. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you, Sam. Thank you, men. I appreciate y'all. Thank y'all so much. I feel like um, all week I've been struggling for how I wanted to start this message. When I'm writing sermons, I generally craft how I'm going to begin on my intro. It's generally the last thing that I craft. And to be honest, I really struggled on how to start this particular message because I feel like the text that we're about to look at is so difficult to cover, not because it's difficult to understand, but I feel like it's difficult to cover because so much of it is prevalent in the church age that we live in. And I fear that some of it is also in the room and that this may be uncomfortable for a lot of you in the room. And I'm just like praying in tears this week that you would look past my voice and my stature and that some way, somehow you would hear the spirit of God maybe just beckoning out to you. I've learned, Rosa, that there's a certain category of people that you just can't help. I want to help some of you stop wasting your time, get out of bad relationships. Uh, In this life, there's there's a certain category of people you, you just can't help. It doesn't matter how much you pray for them, how much you counsel them, how much you talk to them. You, you, you just can't help them. Among that category of, of people you just can't help are people who are so grossly unaware of their own selves that nothing you say to them can really help them to see that you are wrong in a particular circumstance or wrong in a particular art or whatever the case may be. It's like you just can't see that you're wrong. I was, I, was, I was talking to my wife today, uh, uh, the other day, and just, I was just thinking about men, Lena, when I think about human beings, and I just think about how the enemy of our soul has done such a magnificent job of deceiving humanity and causing us to believe things that are not true. When, when, I, when I think about deception as a whole, I think about the most damaging deception that I think is not even probably the one that the enemy perpetrates on unsuspecting people, but I think sometimes the most damaging deception that is prevalent in our churches, maybe in this room, is the deception you perpetrate on yourself. I think self-deception is more damaging than deception on the unsuspecting. I mean, if you fool somebody who has no common sense, that's one thing, but to fool yourself is another thing. To live a lie is a damaging thing. And to spend years going in a direction only to learn in the end I went the wrong way with my time is a very damaging thing. Man, the only thing I truly fear more than anything, I don't fear people. I don't fear men. I don't fear the streets or being in the hood. I don't need an entourage. I don't fear being by myself. Got no problem getting on a plane or being in a shootout or throwing blows with somebody. I'm not afraid. Let me tell you what I fear more than anything, right? Let me tell you what I fear more than anything. I fear more than anything dying full. You missed that. Leaving this life having not done what I was supposed to do. Leaving this life having learned from my Savior. I gave you 80 years and you blew it. Let me repeat, the the thing that I fear more than anything else is leaving this life at whatever age that is and learn from my Lord when I see him eye to eye that, Philip, I gave you 80 years and you blew it. You, You left all of that on the table. Watch, you miss me. That's why some of the most frightening words in the scriptures are not just talks about hellfire and brimstone. You know what's the most frightening words in the scriptures? 
many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all of this in your name? In your name, did we not preach, prophesy, cast out demons, sing on the worship team, preach sermons, served at the front door, ushered, went to conferences, bought books, listen to podcasts, and he will just say from you, listen, depart from me. You work of iniquity, I never knew you. You, 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 you know everyone is going to arrive in the lobby of heaven, but not everyone is going to stay there. And, and I, sometimes I wonder what it's going to be to be on that line, stare at the Lord in the face, only to hear you can't go past him. And that there's only one other option to go. Like, so we tough right now, trying to ignore him. We are not ready for that judgment. And, and, and the person I feel the most concerned for is not the atheists or, or, or not, not the tribe that has not yet heard the gospel. The person I feel the most sorry for is for the person sitting in the pew. The functional atheist that comes to church. I, I, I know, I know. The, 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 watch, the functional atheist, the one that comes to church, the one that gets on the team, the ones that throw God their little leftovers, a dollar in the offering every now and then, like he's pleased with that. The one that actually think the Lord and I are in good standing while you've been deceiving yourself for all these decades. That is the person I'm most concerned about, watch, because that is the person is hardest to help with the gospel. I'd rather help somebody that know I ain't right. Tell me what I need to know. That's different from someone says, I know I'm right, and you can't tell me what I need to know. Y'all yeah, missed that. Let me go over here. I'd rather help somebody that's not right and say, tell me what I need to know, yeah. than try to help somebody that says, I need to know nothing. And you can't tell them what they really need to know. Those people are not at the corner when you drove by to get here. Those people are on your row. They're in the chats. They're in churches all across America. Professing believers who are probably, I don't even want to use this word, borderline unhelpable. Can I say that? Borderline unhelpable. You tell me what's worse, being far away from God and dying and being lost, or thinking you're near. Dying and being lost. Which one do you think is worse? If I was going to be lost, I should have just spent my life being ratchet and doing me. I spent all that time going to services and going to conferences and buying books, all to die and realize I, w I, I was lost the whole time. Yeah. That's far more worse than being completely far away from God. Enter the church at Laodicea. This, this, these, these gathering of believers that I think in the text it's probably the people in the worst condition of the seven churches. The people who had the Lord had absolutely nothing good to say about them, right? You know, and, and before I jump into this text, I don't have time to unpack this, but let me just parenthetically insert this. I want you to notice that Jesus never sent a letter to a person. He sent letters to bodies of believers, right? I want you to feel in fact that, that the Lord never sent letters to individuals. He sent them, these seven letters, to bodies of individuals, hoping that the individuals in the body would read them. Why? Trying to give you a clue that we belong inside community. Yeah. Some of these churches was ratchet, but people were still inside community. Nowhere in the scripture are we called to do this life alone. It is, it is the work of Satan to move you into isolation and disconnect you from the family of God. Listen, all throughout the New Testament, we see the calling of God upon sons and daughters to live out your life in gospel community. Watch, in local bodies, we don't see God calling us to be rogue Christians. We, let me say that again. We don't see God calling us to be rogue Christians. So when we, say, when we hear things like, I don't need a church. 
I don't need that church. Don't need a pastor, an elder, a shepherd. You are drifting into a place where you are hard to help. And you're drifting to a place where you're being, watch, you're deceiving your own self to think that God has called you to a rogue Christianity. Do you know one of the greatest sanctifying agents in this life after marriage is being in community with people? I, I should repeat that. One of the, when I say sanctifying agents, the things that rub you like sandpaper, that transforms your character, that shapes you, that molds you, that helps you to watch mature. The only thing after marriage that's a greater sanctifying agent is being in this messy thing we call community. Say, so I don't like her. She don't like you. I don't like him. He don't like you. But as y'all work through that conflict, you come out on the other side with greater character. You can't do that when you only wear sneakers, and every time you get offended, you find a new church. I'm talking to everybody in this room right now. Stay and work through conflict and argue and fight and curse and then go get lunch afterwards and grow. Right? Because the body of Christ, the local churches, it is a messy, glorious thing that God has called us to. And as we work through this glorious mess and different personalities and issues, and I don't like Rhonda and Tiana prays too loud. And as we work through all of that, we come out on the other side more mature. That's why when you read the New Testament, I've been saying this to people for years, the driving force of the New Testament is not to give you what you want. The driving teachings of the New Testament is to bring you into maturity. That's why if you pay attention to every letter in the New Testament, the writers of the letters are addressing issues. I mean, the church at Corinth was the most reckless church we've ever seen. People having sex on Sunday morning, getting drunk with communion, divorcing their wives and having sex with their son-in-law. It's Christians going wild. The church at Ephesus was racist. That's why Paul talks about the dividing line. Are y'all picking up on that? The church at Thessalonica was lazy. They thought Jesus was coming the next day, so let's not spread the gospel. The church at Rome did not understand the gospel, so Paul had to explain it to them. Are y'all picking up on that? The church at Galatia heard the gospel, got set free, and then said stuff like, I can't eat pork. The Sabbath was Saturday, so we shouldn't go to church on Sunday. The Lord will be mad at me if I wear pants and I'm a woman. I shouldn't have earrings. I shouldn't have lipstick. I shouldn't get tattoos. That's the church of Galatia being bound by man-made doctrines. Paul had to say to them, you foolish Christians who has betrayed you, bewitched you. All these letters, he's addressing issues. Love one another. Be kind to one another. Bear one another's burdens. Submit to one another. Wives submit. It's all addressing issues. So at some point in time, you just got to stay planted long enough to see God, what he would do in your life if you get rubbed on just a little bit. I don't like Philip Anthony Mitchell. Every time he preach, I go home with corns. The solemn words of Christ to the final church in ancient Asia Minor, the church of Laodicea, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen. This is powerful language. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Now, all throughout this series, I've been helping you understand the cities that these letters was written to, because if, if you won't understand the words of Christ to the church if you don't understand the city, okay? The city of Laodicea was a very interesting city. In fact, of all the cities that I studied, this one was my favorite to study because of the things that I learned about this city, okay? So Laodicea was founded by a man named Antichus II, who named the city after his wife, Laodice, okay? Um, Laodicea was... Uh, the wealthiest of the seven churches that these letters went. So of these seven cities, Laodicea was the wealthiest of these cities. Where it was situated, it was situated at the crossroads of two major Roman trade routes of commerce. 
which caused a banking industry to emerge in Laodicea. So think New York City, the New York Stock Exchange, think Charlotte. So in this city, this city was a banking hub. There was many banking firms in this city, and all of the major trade routes through Asia Minor, the major ones ran through this city. This city grew very prosperous, very wealthy. Think Miami, think New York. I'm thinking of other wealthy cities. Think of Scottsdale, Arizona, a city where the average person in the city was middle to upper class, very few poor people in this city. Um, Laodicea uh, was completely ruined in AD 60. You can research this. The city was flattened by a massive earthquake in AD 60. And when that earthquake happened, the, the government or Rome was giving out PPP loans. <laughs> True story. Like, nothing is new under the sun. Like, long before there was a President Biden throwing money out, Rome was trying to throw money out to help rebuild cities. Yeah, yeah. Cities was collecting that money to rebuild. The Laodiceans said, nah, we don't need that government loan. We will rebuild our own city with our banking industry. In fact, uh, Titicus, who I like, was a Roman official. He was known as one of the greatest historians in the Latin language. He wrote these words, Laodicea arose from the ruins by the strength of her own resources. Nobody want to tie my shoe for me? <laughs> and with no help from us. So this city was so financially strong that when it was leveled, it rebuilt the city with its own money. The city also had um, a fertile plain with very good soil, and in this city, they was known for grazing uh, special goats and lambs, and, and because of that, they was able to breed certain animals to produce a type of wool that was shiny and black, and this city was known for exporting this wool around the world, this black wool, so it was worn by those who were like aristocrats, those who were fancy, you see them pulling up to the party in this black wool, right, it was shiny. Very, very important. Also, too, Laodicea, unlike any other of these cities, was known for having a world-renowned medical school. Now, this blew my mind. This city had a world-renowned medical school that created or discovered an invention, a powder, that if you mix the powder with water and rubbed it on your eyes, it would actually bring healing to eyes that were wounded, a type of salve. That if you rubbed it on the inside of your eyes, whether sand or dirt or sun damaged people's eyes, it was the first medicine created in that time that actually helped people to heal eye wounds. It was an eye salve that they exported all around the world. They were known for this. The, 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 the last thing I thought that was so intriguing about the city of Laodicea is where it was built. It was built on a fertile plateau and maybe about six miles to the north of Laodicea was a city called Heropolis. And in the city of Heropolis, it was built on volcanic ground. And so it had natural hot springs. Those hot springs are still active to this day. And water will seep through Heropolis into the ground, and then it will bubble back up as hot water, these hot springs, and that hot springs will flow down the plateau six miles towards Laodicea. About 10 miles to the west of Laodicea was the ancient city of Colossae, where Somebody give me a micro, oh, word, microphone check, one, two, one, two. So, so about 10 miles to the west was the city of Colossae where, where Paul wrote the letter of Colossians. And in the city of Colossae, they was known for having pure cold water. And, and to the north was this, this city called Heropolis where they had hot springs that flowed towards Laodicea. Laodicea was built on the Lycus River Valley, and the river they was built along was so murky they couldn't drink the water. So this city was known for having water problems. So powerful. This city was known for having water problems. So what this city would do, they built aqueducts. I think I got a picture. Do you got my picture of the aqueducts? Yeah. They built aqueducts that's still visible to this day out of stone. And they built these aqueducts from Laodicea all the way to the north in Heropolis, watch, to harvest hot water from the north to bring it into the city. But by the time it traveled the 10 miles to get to the city, it was no longer hot. It was warm, 
And because they use a certain type of stone, they didn't understand the technology of this stuff, the water would gather minerals in the stone, and by the time it reached Laodicea, the water would be warm, full of these minerals and silt that when you drank it, it made you nauseous. So they had a constant water problem. The water they try to get from Colossae that was ice cold would be warm by the time they get to the city. And the water they try to get from Heropolis that was piping hot would be warm by the time it got to the city. So these people was always plagued with drinking warm, polluted water that made you nauseous when you sipped it. We'll come back to that in a second. Christ says to them, watch, the words, give me verse 14, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Notice what the Lord, how he introduces himself. He styles himself as the amen. Now, this, when we hear amen, is normally, we, we, we hear it as a tagline we throw at the end of every prayer in the name of Jesus, amen. The word amen means so let it be. But much deeper than so let it be, when the Lord calls himself amen, he's, he's tagging himself to texts from the Old Testament. When he wrote this, there was no New Testament. So he's tagging himself to the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, the word amen was a word that God used to describe himself. This is important. It's going to make sense in a moment. So the Lord was saying to the church of Laodicea, I am not only Christ, I am Christ God in the flesh. I am Jehovah God. So he says to them, I am the amen. I am the God of the Old Testament. He's affirming, watch, his deity to this church that I, I am more than just a man. I am the God man, right? I'm the one that is steady and unchangeable in all purposes and promises. I cannot lie. What I say will come to pass, and if I made a promise to you and you walk in my will, man, that promise will come to pass. I am the amen. When I say it, it is settled. When I spoke it over your life, it was settled. And the only person that can ruin that is your disobedience. When I say, I want to encourage somebody. It's been years since that thing has come to pass, but the Lord didn't forget. Oh, I feel this in my spirit. I don't know who this is for. I feel the spirit telling me to encourage someone. The Lord has not forgotten you. If you just keep walking in obedience, everything that amen said to you will come to pass because he's not a man that he should lie. There's two things God cannot do. He cannot fail. He cannot lie. It is impossible for him to lie. He is, watch, the amen, unchangeable, settled on his promises and his purposes. He says, I am the faithful and the true witness. Watch, the one whose testimony of God to men ought to be trusted. So he's saying to these people, I am God in the flesh. It's going to make sense in a moment. I'm God in the flesh, and whatever I say, you need to trust. Whatever I say, you need to trust. He says, I am the beginning of all creation, not I am a created being. Come on. But I was the beginning of all creation. Everything that was created was created towards me, so through me. So the Lord is affirming himself as God to the Laodiceans, right? A church about 10 miles west of Colossae, right? Where both gatherings was really being plagued by a similar issue, right? They were being plagued by a wrong perspective of Jesus. This is very important. Watch. Because when you read the letter of Colossians, like Paul is making this four-chapter argument to them that Christ is divine, that he's God in the flesh. And it's very possible, I believe from my study, that bad teaching that was in Colossae traveled 10 miles and ended up in the church of Laodicea, but did more damage in the church of Laodicea because they had money. Right? Right? L listen to these words of Paul, for example, that he wrote to the church of Colossae. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Listen to this. Uh, he, says, he says to the church in Colossae, 10 miles away, He, who is Christ, is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. I get excited, y'all don't. You don't even have to preach to me. Just read the word and I get excited. For by him, Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rules, authorities, all things were created through him and for him. You were created for him. You were not created for your Boaz. I know when you think you get him, he's going to make you happy. You're going to be mad at him when he start passing gas on you and he's not taking out the trash. Like, no, you wasn't created. You, you were created for the glory of Christ. Your whole functionality was to bring Christ glory. That's why in this life you can't pick purpose. You have to discover it. There's so many of you chasing purpose. That is asinine. You can't pick your purpose. You can't manufacture your purpose. You have to discover it because you already created to give glory to someone. That's like an iPhone trying to tell Apple how it should function. Can you imagine how idiotic it would be for a phone to hop out the box and try to function other than the way the designer made it? You spend your whole time making wrong phone calls. If you would just read the manual, I'll tell you how to make two ways, three ways, videos, everything. Like you were already created and fashioned by Christ for purposes he already fixed for you before you were even born. Corinthians, uh, Ephesians chapter two, verse 10. Works that he prepared for you before time. Your real job is to find the path, not create it. I'm trying. I'm trying to help some of y'all stop wasting your time. Your real job is not to create the path, it's to find it. If you find the path, everything else falls into place. See, this is the lies that we are preached to, that everybody's trying to pursue the purpose you want to create. Watch. The Lord has said a gentleman, he'll let you build a monument to yourself and tell you in the end that you miss what I created you to do. Let me repeat this to somebody. You cannot pick your purpose. You must, what's the word? You must discover it. You gotta search it out and find the path that he already created for you. This is Ephesians 2.10. This is why I tell my children, when people ask you what you wanna be when you grow up, stop telling them you wanna be a doctor. If you ask any one of my children, jam them up in the hallway and ask them what you want to be, what you grow up. You know what they're going to tell you? And they're going to say, I want to fulfill my purpose. God may have called you to be a doctor, but then if you go be a veterinarian or if you go be something else, the point I'm trying to make is, is, is he's not cruel. He designed something that will bring you fulfillment. You just have to discover it. You talking, to a, you talking to a man from Queens that some way somehow made it out of college and was headed to law school because of my mouth and because I like to argue and fight. I said, man, I'll make a great attorney. And I thought my purpose was to be in the courtroom. I'll take that, Mama T. I am an attorney. I am an attorney. I just argue for somebody else now. Yeah. What verse was I on? Verse 17. And before all things and him and all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be the preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Because of the blood of the cross, we have peace. Now, chapter 4, verse 16, he says, he spends the whole letter trying to convince the church at Colossae that Christ was God in the flesh. And in the verse, chapter 4, verse 16, he says, and when this letter has been read among you, the Colossians, have it also read in the church at the Laodiceans, 10 miles away, and see that you also read the letter from the Laodiceans. So he said, when you get this letter, send it to them. And when they get their letter, I'm going to have them send it to you. 
The letter that Paul wrote to Laodicea, we don't have that letter. It has been lost in antiquity. But we know that he wrote them a letter. So, 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 so this church and the church at Laodicea are both wrestling with the same thing. They have an improper view of Christ. Their false belief about Christ bubbling in Colossians makes it to Laodicea. Both churches are wrestling with a false view of Christ. Christ writes them a letter. Paul writes them a letter. I mean, this congregation is battling with bad teaching. Who are the pastors? I mean, truth be told, if your Christology is off, all of your doctrine is off. Yo, shout out to my man, William Branch, a.k.a. the ambassador. Yo, if your your view of Christ is off, all of your faith is off. If we see... I'm about to get in trouble, okay? I don't care about your DMs. If your view of Christ is off... All of your doctrine is off into the Church of Mormonism, into Jehovah's Witness, right? Into New Age philosophy. All of your Christ theology is off. All of your doctrine is off. And and my approach towards them is is not, not, I don't want to argue, but I want to engage them in humility. I want to engage them in, in I want to I want to engage them in, in humbleness and I want to pray for them and believe that God would save them out of these these spin-offs of Christ, these spin-offs of Christianity that's leading people to damnation. You, you got to dig deep in a doctrine and you realize Christ is not at the center. He's a name they throw on it, but he's not a name at the center. Y'all don't read. They, they, they throw Christ on the Church of Mormon, but Joseph Smith is their prophet. And I don't care what you put together or how much money you amass, if your Christology is off, your whole doctrine is off. So we, we want to pray that God would deliver them from, 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 from religious darkness. And when they knock on the door, engage them with a heart of love. Whether it's a Jehovah's Witness track or or two dudes in a white shirt, man, let me try to give you the pure gospel and deliver you from the bondage of false religion. And for this, they will cry hate speech when it's the truth of God's word. If what I believe about the Lord is off, my whole faith is going to be off. So we can, we, can, we can engage them in humility and pray for them and pray for the lost, but, but, and, and God, God can help the one who's willing to listen. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you somebody, God cannot help. He cannot help the arrogant who think that they are correct. If you're arrogant and you think that you cannot be changed, you cannot be corrected, if you, there's only one person that can't be taught, and that's God. God can't learn. Let me, let me help you. God is the only person that can't learn. He can't grow. He can't be taught. You know why? Because he's perfect. You can't teach somebody anything that they know everything. That's why God can't learn. God can't grow. He can't change. He can't be enlightened. You can't, you, sovereignty has no ambiguity. So there's nothing you could teach him that he doesn't already know. You, my friend, and me, my friend, have a lot of growing to do. I might be preaching something in this season that 10 years from now, I might look back and say, Philip, how the heck did you say that from the platform? Your doctrine was off. We got to keep growing. Die with a, with a book under your pillow. Keep growing. I'll tell you, one person God struggles to help, almost can't help, is the arrogant. People who are brash and false beliefs about Christ or even about themselves, you think you arrived because you've been walking with the Lord for so long and because you could pray or you know 15 verses by heart so nobody can't help you get to the next level because you can't be taught. There's no one in this room including the person with the microphone that can't be taught. One of y'all can school me in the lobby about something I've been off about doctrine and I will listen. The worst place to be is to be so arrogant that no one can't enlighten you or help you grow. This is the church of the Laodiceans, right? So watch, I'm almost done. Watch 
the scathing rebuke of Christ to this body of arrogant Christians, if they were Christians, who, who could not be taught. Verse 15. Can I teach? Please, can I, can I teach? For, just give me a little while. Can I teach? Verse 15. I know your works. Gosh, this is so profound. You are neither cold nor hot. And then he begs them, man, I wish that you were either cold or hot. I wish you were just one of the two. Lord, help me preach this right now. But so because you are lukewarm, see, they know what this feels like because this is their drinking water problem. So because y'all are lukewarm, look at the master teaching of Jesus using things in the physical element to help them understand y'all are all messed up. Jesus is a genius. I'm a dig in your heart with the stuff y'all know well. All that nasty water y'all be drinking, y'all just like that water. He said, but because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Man, pause. The Lord ain't never said something so harsh to a group of people. This is the most aggressive language of Jesus recorded anywhere in scripture to a group of people in a church. This is the harshest letter written of all the seven. And I want you to pay attention to the heart of Christ. The Lord said to this church, everybody watch, you are lukewarm. So because you're lukewarm, I'm gonna spit you out of my mouth. I'm gonna spit you out. Watch to your whole lukewarm congregation. Watch, you make me sick. This is deep. He says to a body of believers, look, every time you see the word church, stop thinking building. He's talking to people in the pews. He said, your whole body is so lukewarm, y'all make me sick. You make me so sick, I just want to vomit when I think about your church. Big name, big title, wealthy believers, big budget, big building, big programs. Y'all so lukewarm. You not hot or cold. When I look at y'all, you make me want to vomit. He said, I wish it was hot or cold. What does that mean? Why is this so serious? Why should we pay close attention? Now, hot, cold, lukewarm. Now, I want to unpack this for you in one of two ways, okay? So I interpret this one of two ways. I'm not sure which one is correct, so I'm going to give you both. And whatever land on your lap, okay? Because nobody really knows what he means by hot, cold, lukewarm. We all are theologians trying to figure this out. I land on two interpretations. I'm going to give you both. And whichever one deal with your heart, take that and be changed. Okay? So my first interpretation is that Jesus used these adjectives, hot, cold, lukewarm, as contrasting effectiveness. Okay, let me make this sense. Make sense for you. Almost done. He's talking to a city with water problem. To the north of them is Heropolis that has volcanic hot springs. When that water bubbles up from volcanic hot springs to this day, it has medicinal qualities. You could drink that hot water and it'll help heal your body. He's talking to a church that 10 miles to the east is Colossae that has pure, fresh, cold drinking water. That when people, when people were thirsty from the hot sun, they would drink the water from Colossae because it would refresh them as they drank. Waters to the north that bring healing. Waters next to you that revive. Okay. Waters to the north that bring healing. And waters to the, to the west of you that, re, that revive. Waters that bring healing. And waters that bring refreshing. Waters that bring healing. And waters that bring refreshing. 
I, I, I feel like my first interpretation that the contrast then is between the hot medical waters of Heropolis and the healing properties that it has, the cold, pure waters of Colossae, and the refreshing waters that it has for those who are thirsty. That the church of Laodicea was providing neither refreshment for their people who were weary or healing for people who were spiritually sick. And so since they was not a healing body and since they was not a refreshing body, their lukewarmness meant that they was ineffective in creating change. In other words, y'all, lukewarmness means you are use, useless to me. That warm drinking water that y'all take from Laodicea that you got to keep spitting out is so bad, it's useless. So my first interpretation is that you can't bring healing like that hot water. You can't bring refreshing like that cold water. But because y'all are lukewarm, in my eyes, you are so useless to me, I have no other choice but to spit you out. Your church keep having services. I can't use you to make a real impact. In this interpretation, lukewarmness is ineffectiveness. My second interpretation. My second interpretation is that Christ used these adjectives as, how can I put it, as temperatures. Uh, he used these adjectives as, as temperatures. You know, um, thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, I got to say something about this. I know some of you feel tense because I said lukewarm means you're ineffective I've been lukewarm and even in the dark night of the soul when I felt like I was lukewarm you know what my prayer is God use me or convict me but don't spit me out Somebody listening to me right now. God, use me or convict me, but please don't spit me out. If you're in this room and you're in a lukewarm state, man, God, use me or God, deal with me, but please don't spit me out. Just don't get rid of me. Keep me close enough to warm me back up again. Please, Lord, don't spit me out. Don't get rid of me. I know I'm not where I'm supposed to be. But, Lord, just tap my heart, please. Watch. I've prayed like this. God, I know I'm not where I'm supposed to be right now. But please don't get rid of me. I'll be like, please don't take your hand off of me. Please don't take your spirit away from me. Lord, don't spit me out. Somebody shout, Lord. Lord, don't spit me out. No. Use me or convict me. I want you to talk to him right now. Somebody say, Lord, use me or convict me, but don't spit me out. This first interpretation I have is probably the correct one because the Lord actually preferred for them to be cold. He actually said, I wish you were cold or hot. He actually wants them to be one of the two. So this interpretation is probably the right one. I want you to either bring healing, or I want you to bring refreshing. I want you to be useful to me. But just for the sake of argument, I got another interpretation. That the Lord used these adjectives as temperatures. And that hot would represent having passion having fire and not being a dead cold not being a dead Christian that if it's temperatures then cold will represent being a place where I recognize I have a need where I know how to cry out to God from a dark place or anybody's ever been in a dry place yes 
right? In a, in a dry place, I know that I'm not forgotten and I could cry out to God. So I'd rather, I'd rather even be cold, be humble enough to know that you need me. Yeah. Or be hot, man, be on passion and be on fire. Tear up the whole church with your zeal. Yeah. Or, or, or lay down at the altar and cry out to me for help. I'd rather do one of those two. Look warm or big than complacency. Yeah. Indifference. Yeah. I don't really care either way. One foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom. I don't care about the gospel, helping people. Don't care about the person who's poor, I drive by. I don't really give a darn. I'm just going to go to church, check off my box, and go home. I really don't care. Either way, whether lukewarm is effectiveness or it's complacency, we don't want to live there. Which one you think it is? One or two? Everybody who says one, lift your hand. Everyone who says two, lift your hand. See, whichever one you lifted for is what the Holy Spirit spoke to you. Amen. Let's finish. Why was this church lukewarm? Verse 17, for you say... I have prospered, I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. He said to this church, y'all are so secure in your affluence and your finances that you have drifted far away from me. This is the worst place that a believer could be is when you, when you trade Christ in for idolatry when you replace him for the worship of money, doctrine, people, or outcomes, right? The accumulation of money and false beliefs has the power to ruin many people, and there are whole churches and denominations like this. They are wealthy and warped at the same time. Now, now look here. I'm not, I'm not against getting a bag. I'm not against hustling. I'm not against money. God is not against money. God is not against wealthy Christians. Abraham was wealthy. David was wealthy. Solomon was wealthy. God is not against wealth. Anybody preach to you and say God is against wealth, that's not good doctrine. God is not against wealth. God is against the love of wealth. He's against when wealth becomes a lowercase g for you, a God where you serve that more than you serve him. Where if you wake up, if, if all you think about is hustle, grind, get to the bag, and Christ is at the back of that, then wealth has become an idol for you. When the Lord says, if you keep me first, all those things you chase in, they will follow you. Seek first the kingdom, and all these things you're trying to get, they will just follow after you, Elder Eric, who told his story, who came here poor, lived in his car. Now he's in a position where God has blessed him. He kept the kingdom first, and God put him in a place of influence. Some of you, the things you're hustling for, God will just give it to you if you keep him first. Right? He's not against that, right? God does not condemn believers having money, but I will say it does take maturity to be prosperous and godly. I should say that again. It takes maturity to be prosperous and godly. There's some of you, the only thing, hold, listen, bless my bit. You know why he ain't do it yet? Because he's still working on the character of your heart. God knows some of the stuff we're praying for, and he gives it to you, you'll forget about him. It takes a certain level of maturity to prosper financially, watch, and still have hunger spiritually. Jesus. I should say that one more time. It takes a certain level of maturity, spiritual maturity, to prosper financially and still have sustained hunger spiritually. Because oftentimes when we prosper, we're not as hungry spiritually. You know you mature when you can prosper financially and still be hungry spiritually. Like, God, you've blessed my business, you've blessed my fill-in-the-blank, but I want you. You've made me a millionaire, but I want you. You've given me the house I've always wanted to live in, but I want you. Thank you for this car, but I want you. You blew up my album, but I want you. It takes maturity for your thing to blow up and you still be spiritually hungry. Lord, I want you. He said, there was wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. He was warning them. Let's finish. Verse 18. So he says to them, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich 
and buy white, <laughs> so, so smart, white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve, look what he's doing to anoint your eyes. Look what he's doing so that you may see. He's talking to people who has the best medical school in all of Asia Minor. He's speaking to a wealthy group of people. He's saying from them, y'all are saying you're so wealthy, you don't need anything, but you don't realize you still have more to purchase. I want you to buy from me. What does he tell them to buy? Three things. He tells them, buy from me gold refined in fire. You know what that is? That is, that is righteousness. When you take gold and you burn it, all the impurities come to the top, and then the goldsmith know that the gold is ready when he can see his reflection in the gold. And he's saying, man, when you are refined by God, every time I look at you, I can keep seeing my reflection in you. Every time you're refined by God, I'm bubbling out of you all the impurities. You've been walking with me for 10 years, I see more of me in you. You've been walking with me for 20 years, I see more in you. God, why are you allowing me to go through this? Because I'm bubbling up all the impurities. Some of the hell you're going through, he's not going to deliver you from because he's using it to get out all of the impurities. That by the time he brings you out of what you're going through, he looks at you and he sees more of his reflection in you. So he says, I want you to buy from me, watch self-awareness, self-awakening, spiritual awakening, righteousness. The second thing he says, buy from me white garments. The Lord is a beast. He's saying this to people that wear black wool. He said, all that black y'all got on? Don't talk about me. He said, I want you to buy from me, listen, white garments. You know what he's saying? I want you to buy from me Watch, the forgiveness that covers the shame of your sin. See, some of you who feel guilty and condemned all the time, what you really need is the covering of the Lord. You can't find forgiveness outside of Jesus. There's somebody in this room right now, you always feel condemned, you're always running, looking for what you really need is the cross. At the foot of the cross, you'll find the forgiveness you need to release you from the pain of your past. And look at the third thing he told him to buy. He said, I want you to buy from me eye salve. Saying this to a church of people that got a medical school that produced powder to heal wounds of the eyes. Y'all are so messed up you can't see. I want you to buy from me, watch, spiritual sight. That the closer you get to God, the better you see. Watch, not the longer you walk with him. Some people walk with God for 20 years and still can't see. It's not how long you've been saved, it's how close are you to the master. The, the closer you get to him in intimacy, the clearer you see. There, I know what it is to do Christianity like this. Go to work like this, get married like this, hang out with your children like this, go to the movies like this, go to church like this, serve on a team like this, be on staff like this. Sing songs like this, preach sermons like this, been saved for 10 years, you're still like this. It's not about time, it's intimacy. Yeah. The closer you get to God, because he's, he's a consuming fire, the closer you get to the fire, the more he burns off what you cannot see. Let me, let me finish up. What is the Lord saying to this church? I feel like he's saying to them what he's saying to people in this room. You listening? Don't move. The Lord is pleading with them to repent. He's pleading with them to repent. Everybody look at me. He's pleading with them to repent. Hold on, Sam. Look at me. Because he's pleading with them to repent. Everybody look at me. He's saying, buy from me. What, 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 what is the cost for what he wants them to buy? Humility. I want you to recognize that you need me and you still have growing to do, and the cost for you being better is humility. The cost of Philip Anthony Mitchell getting better is humility. I took one of my staff members, um, Lena and I took a staff member to a lunch not that long ago, and I said to the staff member, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to tell me where can I do better. Why? Because I got blind spots. I love the Lord. I love people. I'm trying. But I know there's some things I can't see in the mirror right there. And I said, listen, you finish eating? Tell me what I need to do better. You know what that took? I, I, I didn't pay for the meal. I had to pay humility to be better. I write down everything they said. 
So I'm going to go home and try to put this in practice. Hopefully, I could be a better pastor as a result of that. It, it costs me humility. Yeah. Although these people were lukewarm, look at the love of God towards them. We're going to finish up the text. Verse 19. Those who I love, I reprove and I discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Everybody, look at the text. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will eat with him and he with me. Look, look at the text. Now look at me. Look at me. Look right at me. Look right at me. Look right for all the evangelists in this room. We've used this for unbelievers. And it works. Look right at me. But who was Jesus talking to? A group of Christians. Christians, not unbelievers. You busy. But I'm on the outside of what you're doing. He's knocking on the hearts of Christians. Watch. Let me in. Let me love you. Let me guide you. That's good, sir. Let me heal you. Let me show you. Let me correct you. Let me rebuke you. Why? Because those you love, you rebuke and you correct. Jesus. Let me tell you about yourself. Let me rub around. Let me dig in your heart. He's standing on the outside of the doors of a church saying, yo, to the church. Yo, let me in there. This ain't hit y'all like it hit me. There's whole churches like this. Busy. And Christ is not allowed. Holy Spirit can't move. God forbid you disrupt your program. Your sermons are perfect and your worship sets are perfect and your children's ministry is perfect and your people look perfect and your parking lot team is perfect and Christ ain't there. This is why you can't be moved by what you see. You got to know what you feel in the spirit. We've been to churches and have not felt his presence. He's, yo, can, can, I, I, it only takes one person to open the door to change a church, a team, a marriage, a family, a friend. It just takes one person to say, Christ, I will let you in. Amen. Your family's a mess, let him in. Yeah. Your marriage is a mess, let him in. Yeah. Pastor, the church is a mess, let him in. He ain't knocking on the door of the unbeliever heart in this text. We could keep using that for evangelism. I ain't going to take that away from you. I'm going to use it. But in context, he's talking to Christians. How is Christ locked out of his own church? What about your door? Look at me. What about your door? I'm talking to you now. I'm talking to you. Look at, look at me. Uh, I, I, look, look right at me. I'm t what about your door? I'm talking to you, my brothers and sisters. I want you to search your house. Not the house you're going home to, the house you're living in. All of your work, your, your, the businesses you're building, all that you're doing, pause and just think, is Christ on the inside of your house? It, he's knocking on some of your doors, saying, I ain't gonna dis I'm not going to take away from you the business. Just let me help you do it better. Just let me in. Yeah. That boy you about to be with, he, if you let me in, I'll tell you, he's not, he ain't for you. That girl, she ain't, just let me in. Watch what I do when you give me control. Let me go deeper. Let me have more authority. Watch what happens when you actually yield to my leadership. I will do things in your life you would never imagine. Man, I beg somebody in this room, man, would you just stop being busy and just let him, like you busy, but is he inside? <laughs> Verse 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit on my throne as also I conquered and sat down with the right hand 
with my Father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. I'm, I'm done, Sam. Um, I don't want anybody to move because I feel something in my spirit. Don't move. I want, I want everybody in that hallway, bring them in this room. Everybody out there, bring them in this room. Every security guard, every usher, get them all in this room. I feel something in my spirit. Get them in this room. Now, put that down. Come out of there. Y'all come sit down here for a second. You stay right there. Y'all brothers, come, come down here. Somebody get them a seat in one of these rows. Get everybody out there in here. Seven times, the Lord says in seven letters, those who has an ear to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. Christ didn't only speak this to these seven churches. Let me, let me, let me, let me land the plane with this. Look, he didn't only speak these letters to these seven churches. Can I make you a theologian for a moment? Please? If you study these churches in its proper context in the book of Revelation, the reason Christ chose these seven churches, not only were they ancient gatherings of believers, they represent the church age of all time. From the founding of the church in the first century A.D. to the return of Jesus. He said, Pastor, I don't get it. The five issues that we see in these churches are the five issues that plague churches all across time are the cycles that Christians find themselves in all the time. You ain't pick up on that in the text. To the church at Ephesus, a Christian group who lost their first love, and there have been times in some of your walk where you have abandoned your first love. How I know? You have loved something else more than Christ. A boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, a wife, a career, a job, a business, a following, a social media platform, an idea. It's in the room. To the church at Smyrna, there's times when we all will endure suffering and be tempted to bow out under that pressure. When the Lord is saying, man, suffer well, even if you got to stay there for a season. Don't come out of where I put you. Suffer well. We've been there. All of us have had hardship and trials. You've been there like the church of Smyrna. No? The church at, at, at Pergamum, doctrinal compromise, all of us have believed things that's not true. That stronghold, strongholds ain't up in the air. It's faulty thought patterns in your mind. Some of you got faulty thought patterns from your home, your upbringing, what your mother and your father taught you that's not correct, what your grandmother taught you that's antithesis to the scriptures. You got things that you believe that's not founded in the word of God. Like you love to gossip and slander when these things are satanic and you tear up church. We believe that we do things and that these, we, we got things that we do and believe that, that is an, that's antithetical to the word of God. Pergamum, Thyatira, Thyatira, Jezebel. There's not a person in here that hasn't been caught up in sexual immorality, unless you're a virgin. We all have been immoral, sexually, and perverted, and licentious, and nasty. All of us unless you still got your white dress and your cookie jar ain't been touched and your pipe game has no work we all 98% of us in here know what it is to be immoral no no it's in the room the church at, at, at Sardis come on you ain't never been in a time when you've been dead spiritually dead like a corpse like Ezekiel 37 need wind to blow on your dry bones some of you in here right now you're dead right now you won't jump clap say hallelujah praise you you're dead it's in the room no the church of Philadelphia 
Some of you know what it is to be faithful and feel like the Lord ain't coming through for me. And you're tempted to walk away from being faithful. Lord, I've been faithful for these many years. I still ain't married. I still don't got my husband. This thing still didn't open up that door. You don't know what it is to be faithful and saying, Lord, where are you? I know what that is. To be faithful and say, Lord, you still didn't come through for me? It's in the room. Laodicea? How many lukewarm people are sitting in this room? Watch, all of these things are in the room. And the Holy Spirit will not let me cross into 10 years with us in this condition. Now, if you want to abandon this moment, you can and disobey God. I feel the Spirit telling me we need to repent. All of us. Because there's nobody in here who one of these things you ain't been caught up here. And not in pride or arrogance. I'm starting with all my leaders. Every leader in this church, get down here and get on your knees. Every V group leader, every staff, get on your knees and repent for all of your sin. Starting with the leadership, with the house of God. Every elder, every musician, get on your knees and repent before these people of your sin. Repent of slander and gossip and laziness and being lukewarm and times you've been dead and lazy and not doing your job right. Repent of every time you drop the ball and you're not praying and you're not in your word. You're trying to lead others, but you're not spiritual. Repent. And everybody watching them, don't act like you're better than them. Y'all need to repent. We're going to repent as a church before we cross into a new chapter. You can slip out on your chair. You can get on your knees. You can close your eyes. You can rock. There's nobody in here that don't deserve or don't need forgiveness. We need to all repent. We need a moment of asking God to forgive us. We need to repent. Repent for gossip. Repent for slander. Repent for laziness. Repent for idolatry. Repent for people you have hurt. Repent for being stubborn. Repent for being someone no one can't tell you about yourself. Repent for being someone you can't be corrected, coached, or rebuked. Repent for lies and deeds done in the dark. Repent for the sin you did last night. Repent for sins of commission, things you did, and sins of omission, things you were supposed to do that you never did. Repent for disobedience. No, hold one, hold one key. Repent. Repent for how you treat your husband, how you treated your wife, for how you treat your children. Repent for being a liar. Repent for cheating on your taxes and changing numbers with the government. Repent for taking out loans that you have no intention to pay, which the Bible said is evil. Repent for loving debt. Repent for not being a good steward of your finances. Repent for being stingy and not being generous and not supporting the spread of the gospel when the money belongs to God. Repent for idolatry of money. Repent for serving and trying to lead others while you're practicing sin in the dark. Repent. Tell God you're sorry for everything in your heart, in your mind, every foul thought, everything that you know is not right. Repent for being such a difficult person, you make it hard for people to love you. Repent. Repent for holding on to the past that you won't embrace the future of what God is trying to do. You keep reminding him of what he's forgotten, like he's not trying to do something new. Repent for wallowing in self-pity. Repent for wallowing in self-pity. Repent for loving depression more than the spirit of life. Everybody, repent, beg, cry out to God and ask him to forgive you for your sins. Forgive me, the person with the microphone, for my own idolatry for wanting churches that don't belong to me and crowds I don't have and influence I don't have. Lord, before these people I repent. I repent for being covetous of other pastors and being covetous of people who have buildings and people who have influence and bigger microphones than me when I'm grinding in the backside of a mountain and I'm jealous. Forgive me, Lord. 
forgive me. Forgive me for I've mistreated my wife and provoked my children, have not been a good shepherd and hurt my staff. Forgive me for every person I've hurt that's ever walked through the doors of this church. Forgive me for every leader I've ever hurt, every staff member I've ever hurt, every person that has left because of my growth. I'm sorry, God. Heal every wounded sheep that has heard my voice, that's been wounded even by me. Heal them. I pray for reconciliation with relationships that you have ordained and healing for those who will never come back. I repent for where I've been a poor shepherd. I repent for when I have not properly discipled men, where I have not poured into people around me, where I've been blind to people who've been serving faithfully. I repent for being a, a hard person to work for. I repent. Above all, Lord, I'm sorry for thinking that the life you crafted for me, you made a mistake. For constantly reminding you that I came from Queens and I feel unworthy to pastor and I feel like you made a mistake when you picked me. For constantly telling you that I repent for thinking you, I know better than you. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry for all the ways I've failed you as a shepherd, Lord. I don't want to cross into ten with sin in my heart. Wash us thoroughly from our sin, Lord. Roll away the reproach of our sin. Father, I pray for forgiveness for this whole church, our leaders, these men and women. I pray you would forgive us for our sin. Roll away the reproach that we dread. We repent before you, God, as leaders where we have failed for our sin, our ratchetness, our licentiousness. We repent as a church. We need a new and firm foundation. We confess our sins, God. You said if, if, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us. I pray you would create in us clean hearts, pure hands, pure hearts, clean hands, hands you will not despise, hearts you will not despise. I pray in this moment you will do a surgical work in the hearts of your sons and daughters, beginning with the person with the microphone, my wife, and the leadership of this church. Do a surgical work in our hearts. Help us to see we're not laboring for me. We're not laboring for a check. We're laboring to the glory of your name. We repent for where we have made our own things idolatrous, where we have forgot the mission, where it's just become laborious and just work, and we made it just a job. We repent, we repent, we repent, Lord. Father, I pray you would sweep over this room and bring healing and forgiveness and wash over us with the waters of righteousness. Let your blood flow in the name of Jesus. People who are prideful, repent for pride and arrogance. We repent. Father, I pray you would drive out of this church every demonic force, every demonic presence, every lie of the enemy, every seed the devil has sown, drive it out. Remove every witch. Every witch in this room, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Every warlock in this room, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is against you. Your curses can't work. Your curses become blessings on this house. I pray even you will be brought to your knees, to the foot of the cross, you foul demonic witch, you warlock. We rebuke you and that foul spirit inside you. Throw yourself on the altar and repent and be born again in the name of Jesus. Father, put a hedge of protection around this church. Drive out everything that is dark and insipid and licentious and ugly and nasty. Drive it out. Let us hate everything that you hate. Let us hate gossip, hate slander, 
hate discord, hate division, hate laziness, hate sin. Let us hate everything that you hate. And let us love everything that you love. Teach us to pray. Teach us to worship. Teach us to fellowship. Teach us to live in community. Teach us to be generous. Teach us to love you, love each other, love the kingdom. Teach us to love the sacred gathering of believers. Teach us to use our gifts for your glory. Get us off of the pew. Teach us that you are holy. I pray a spirit of veneration and respect and adoration for you fall upon this house. Again, I pray a spirit of worship, a spirit of prayer, a spirit of humility, a spirit of love, a spirit of community, a spirit of godliness. Come upon this house. I pray that we get up from this place convicted, washed, renewed, turned. All y'all men who do security, I know you strapped and you got your eyes on me. Get on your knees and repent. I got my eyes open. I can watch my own back. Repent, all of y'all. Ask God to forgive you for your sins. Repent. Everybody in that sound booth, get on your knees and repent. I'm talking to you, my son Malachi, everybody back there in that control room. All of y'all, get on your knees and repent. I see your head. Stop being disobedient. Everybody, get on your knees in that control room and repent. my drama at? Get up here. Come on. Get in here. Come on. Minister to these people. We're not going into tent like that. Repent. You know your sin. Repent. Everybody. Now ask God to give you new eyes. Ask him to give you a new heart. Come on. Something's going to change in you right now. Something's going to break. For some of you, you need to just let go of the past and stop reminding him of it. Come on, break the chain of what you keep reminding him of. Walk into the future of the new thing he wants to do in you. He loves you. somebody the Lord says you need to forgive somebody you've been holding for a long time you need to forgive them I know they wronged you I know they assaulted you I know you was great molested and abandoned the Lord said forgive them right now in this moment let them go it's not for them it's for you forgive your parents your father that abandoned you your mother that betrayed you somebody forgive let them go Forgive, forgive, let that person go. Let them go. Release them. Release them. Release them. Release your parents. Release your ex spouse. Release your baby father. Release them, release them. Release your child's mother. Release him. Release the friend that betrayed you. Release them. Life is too short to be holding grudges. Release them. 